Hello and welcome to Essex by the Sea. I'm Owen Ward, exploring the Essex coast, finding out about the amazing and interesting stories it has to offer. Don't forget, if you'd like to support me making the podcast, you can make a small donation on my Ko-fi page. The link to this is in the description. Now, for this episode, we're going to be talking about a part of the Essex coast that may not actually be there for much longer. This is because of coastal erosion, which is washing away part of the Nays at Walton. Uh, I've been to Welton for a previous episode, that was all about the Nays Tower, but the cliff edges around the tower have been getting closer and closer to it. Uh, David Eagle is the acting chair of the Nays Protection Society and joins me for this episode of Essex by the Sea. Hi Owen, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you for, for joining us. Before exploring the concerns that, that uh, people in the society has, uh, could you sort of just give us the, the basics? People might not know what the NAIS is. So, so what is the NAIS and what is happening to it? So the NAIS is effectively a peninsula sort of at the end of Walton on the NAIS. Uh, it's split between a public open space and farmland. Um, the public open space was bought by the council in 1968, uh, then was about 155 acres, of which about a third has now gone into the sea. Of course, you know, the Nays used to be much, much, much bigger and has been going into the sea for ever since it's been there. Uh, and there have been some fairly dramatic events, which are admittedly very historic, but one of which um, the area used to belong to St Paul's at St Paul's Cathedral in London, and when Dunwich disappeared in the 1320s, the same, I think it's the same surge tide uh, event effectively took away three to 400 acres of the Nays and a couple of villages. So the Nays is, you know, there's nothing new about the Nays disappearing. But the unfortunate thing is we've now got to the state where it's our generation, it's our time, when we have a last opportunity to actually hold on to it now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not going to carry on disappearing, but we can slow the process so that the next generation can make a decision as to whether it wants to keep the nays for the future. It's interesting um, to know how large that uh, area was. And, and I think certainly when I visited the, the tower at uh, Walton on the Nays, the, uh, when you look out, you can see... Uh, old World War Two pillboxes which sit down on the beach and it was explained in that episode that actually they used to be on the cliff top and they're now some way away from the edge of the of the cliff so is really what's left of the Nays now the last bit of it and and uh, as you say if, if nothing's done this will go the whole cliff line and that includes the northern beaches as well, has been going back at about a metre to a metre and a half a year traditionally forever and ever and ever. The thing that's changing, and whether this is climate change or whatever it is, that has accelerated. And the areas that we're working on, which is particularly on the north end, that one and a half has now gone, well, went to two and a, over two and a half metres a year between 2016 and 21. That was an average this last year, we've seen that increase to three and a half metres. So there's something different happening. And the fact that the cliffs are made of very soft sediments means that there's nothing there to hold it. The issue is from a, uh, it's not just a simple thing that we want to stop the maze disappearing into the sea. The cliffs were designated as geological SSSI in the late 70s. Next there, geological strata, the fact that um, it depicts an area of geology where the ice uh, flows came to find, sort of actually stopped at in the ice age. And so you've got fossils in there which are both temperate climate and ice age climate, plus all the very deep fossils in the, in the London clay. So it's of great international geological interest. And for that, Natural England has effectively said you can't do anything. Now, having said that, they did compromise to allow Crag Walk to be built, which is to protect the Nays Tower. Our focus is now on the north end, because effectively, if we lose the north end, the sea will get round the back of the Nays and it will enter into Hamford Water, which is a national nature reserve, also designated an SSSI, SA, SAC, SPA, and a Ramsar site. It's also home to 
almost a thousand yachts which are moored in there and in the marinas. So there's a lot of local economic interest in the marine industries. Hanford Water as a national nature reserve, that's 2,000 hectares of intertidal muds and salt marshes. It hosts something around 40 to 50,000 migratory birds in the winter. It's a, a very important patch. And if we lose the nays, we lose that as well. We'll come on to the impact in just a moment. You mentioned about the Crag Walk, and that is part of the defences that, that are already in place. So what is protecting the nays at the moment? Because that doesn't go all the way around it, does it? No, Crag Walk was built as a 110-metre rock. It's called an educational platform rather than a revet. But effectively, its concept was to slow the rate of erosion of the cliffs in front of the tower so that the cliffs would carry on collapsing down until the toe of the cliff moved up against the revetment and the cliffs gradually stabilised and created a, a shallow slope running from top to bottom so that they wouldn't collapse any longer. Mm -hmm. To the north, immediate north of that, it was always recognised that the cliffs were going to carry on moving back. And as they moved back, the sea could get behind Cragwalk. And when Cragwalk was built back in 2010-11, that recognition was always discussed as needing to be extended. Now, the problem that Council have got is that whereas in 2010, when Cragwalk was built, it was cost 1.2 million, the price of rock when we last looked at it, which I think was 2019, had gone up threefold, fourfold. And so what would have cost extending it even 50 metres now would probably cost one and a half to two million pounds. So when you've got a cliff line of a kilometre, which is coming back, it's a very substantial amount of money if you're going to protect it. Mm -hmm. But we do have this geological issue which effectively means that Natural England will object to anything being put in front of the cliffs because they of their statutory issue to protect designated SSSI and allow the cliffs to collapse in order to let the geological strata to be exposed. You've mentioned a number of different people involved in this. There's obviously the society that you're representing and we're talking to. There's Tendering District Council. There are Heritage England that you've mentioned. I think there's sort of Environment Agency. And, and there's loads of different people involved, particularly because of it being a site of special scientific interest. Does that actually help or hinder, do you think, David, in, in the process? Because surely it's, it's regulated and protected so much, nothing should be happening to it. I think part of the problem is, you know, we live in a very complex time and every government agency has, rightly or wrongly, got its own agendas. And they've also got their policies and procedures which are attached to their, their remit. And uh, when it comes down to the coastline, there are so many agencies, and bearing in mind that you have to go through the planning process first before you actually get permissions from the other ones, it's, it's layer upon layer upon layer of permissions needed now. And this is one of the issues that we've just come up with of trying to install the rock revetment that we're on the north end. That's actually tendering district council planning permission for that, which meant that through the planning process, Natural England were consulted, uh, the Environment Agency, Essex County Council, ecology teams, and the Marine Management Organisation. So planning process flushes out all those consultations. But then on top of that, some of those organisations, such as the MMO, the Marine Management Organisation, have their own permitting process, which you then have to get a licence from them as well. And all that takes an extended amount of time. And our experience with the MMO has effectively took us nine months to get that permission, by which time we lost another three and a half metres of cliff, which is critical because within 12 months, all of the north end of the nays would have been flooded if that permission hadn't come through. Mm. So we need to be working in partnership with all these people. We need to bring them to the table and actually sit down and discuss everybody's agendas, everybody's issues, see where there are common areas that we can work with and where the barriers are, the red lines that we can't and sit down really and say, right, well, OK, so... Where are we going in the next 25 years? If we understand and agree a plan, 
then we can raise money in order to do that. If it's absolutely clear that some of the barriers mean that we can't do any work, well, then we have a decision and that will have to be understood by the local community. But what is driving our society is effectively a local community who's got passion that they want to retain their local landscape. And that's where we get conflicts between local communities and these agencies. You said about a 25-year plan there. I'm I presuming you've just picked that number out, out of the air as, as an example. But if things were left as they are, would there be a naze left to protect in 25 years? It's easy to get in this day and age to be labelled an extremist. But as I say, if nothing was done on the bit we're working on at the moment, within 12 months, the sea will flood the north end of public open space. Within five years, the sea will break through into Hanford Water. That is irreversible. And at the moment, we have a small window of opportunity where it's affordable to act. And and by affordable, I mean a few tens of thousands of pounds. So that's why we see it as important to be getting on with it. But the 25 years isn't a completely arbitrary figure. The Environment Agency work, they have a, a, a climate, effectively a climate change plan. And it relates to their shoreline management plans, which work in different e- what they call different epochs. So we're currently just moving into this, the next one, which will end on 2055. By 2055, there is a sort of realisation that climate change will have impacted really seriously. So we're in a transition where potentially we have to manage that change while climate change is still quite benign. I think that we can manage those impacts. Climate change clearly is going to impact on sea level rise, which we haven't really seen yet. Once we start to get sea level rise on a regular basis, which then compounds with more winter storminess, higher tides come with with impacts of strong winds. We're currently, at this particular week, we've got a lot of northeasterlies, which means that the wind is driving the tide up onto the beach is much higher. And all these things combine so that it's very difficult to look into the future and say, well, this is where we're going to be. In the next 25 years, I think we can understand where we're going to be. Beyond that, it gets much, much more complicated. Hmm. I guess some people might say, well, coastal erosion, climate change, yes, we might be able to influence a little bit, but, but a lot of this is, as, you've, as you said, the coastal erosion of the Nays has been happening for years and years and years and years and years. It's just part of nature's cycle, and, and this is nature doing what nature does. It erodes away, it will create new habitat. But what would you say in response to that, and what would the impact be on the likes of the Walton backwaters and, and Hamford water if that was allowed to happen? When the sea enters Hanford Water, the, the habitat there is going, it's not going to disappear overnight. It's going to be go through a transition, an evolution of basically just wearing away. If the sea had its way and we didn't have sea walls, that habitat would just migrate inland and the low-lying farmland would, would convert to marshland and salt marsh in a natural way. Because the seawalls are there, it is not a natural situation. And the Natural England and the Environment Agency have this, this, this process of coastal squeeze. So effectively, the sea comes up, hits the seawall, and it erodes everything in front of it, which means that you're going to lose all that salt marsh. Now, it's a difficult one, and it's one that needs to be flushed out, that these designated areas, of which there are lots up and down the Essex coast, are protected by the government. Now, maybe this is going to create a conflicting conversation with some of these agencies, but effectively, by designating it, they also protect it. Natural processes will reverse that. And if you say, well, we're not going to protect the nades, then actually you're going to allow those natural processes to take place, which means that harmful water will degrade and it will be destroyed. And if it is destroyed, then to some degree, is there an argument which says it We have to mitigate for that and actually find another 2,000 hectares of intertidal national nature reserve somewhere else. Now, the cost of that is astronomic. So this is about finding balance. It's about finding uh, a balance where we can all achieve what we want to achieve, some degree, 
secure biodiversity in the future by looking for that mitigation at a cost which is affordable. The issue about those people who say, well, just let it happen, the argument really is, well, yes, you can just let it happen, but at the moment we can put that off for 20 to 25 years so that we have a controlled management situation, not a crisis management. Clearly a lot of work to be done by a lot of people to ensure that uh, our coastal regions, not just the Nays, but as you mentioned, the, the slightly more inland areas of the backwaters around Walton are protected for future generations. David, time has beaten us, unfortunately, but thank you so much for, for talking us through the situation around the Nays. Work continues, doesn't it, at the moment? You, I know, are currently installing quite a lot of tonnage of rocks uh, around the northern part of the Nays at the moment. Yeah, so we're currently, our MMO licence allows us to secure the end of the seawall, which is eroding fast, and the next 25 metres of cliff. We're then going to come back in in the autumn to protect the next 65 metres of cliff next to that. So that's all the low-lying cliff. And we've also then got to look to working with the council in terms of how the beach area in front of that is going to be made more resilient for the future. Well, David, thank you very much. I won't hold you up any more of your time to get back to that work. So thank you ever so much for joining me on Essex by the Sea. Brilliant. Thanks, Owen. Episodes of Essex by the Sea continue to drop on the 1st and 15th of each month. You can also find the podcast across social media and do take a look at the Kofi page as well. So until next time, thanks very much for listening.